Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Viva la vegan! Hi, I'm Lee Chantel from vivalavegan.net and my guest today is Valerie Wagnitz. She is the founder and the director of a great organization called Think Kind. How are you, Valerie? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So, um, Think Kind, great little um, organization you've got here in um, Australia, and yeah. it's volunteer based. Mm -hmm. as hum humane education organization. Do you want to tell yeah. us a bit about it? Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, my background is actually in resource development. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was doing that, I realized that there was a huge gap um, in the resources I suppose teachers were using um, to uh, deliver um, I, well, well, actually, I should start again. Um, in in New South Wales, a lot of teachers are, have been using a unit called Paddock to Plate, and it teaches kindergarten students to Year One students about food production, so the meat industry, dairy, and egg production industry. Um, and I was actually working on developing resources um, for that unit for a small company, and realised that virtually all teachers were using resources developed by these industries. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, Dairy Australia was supplying schools with um, educational resources um, about dairy production, which, uh, of course, uh, um you know, it, it becomes very problematic when you mix education with, I suppose, another agenda, especially in a way, advertising. Um, and, and of course, um, it did lack accuracy and balance. And um, having volunteered with a few animal protection groups at the time, um, I realized how important it was to actually, um, especially in the context of education, provide a more accurate and balanced um, resource, at least, that teachers could refer to. And, yeah, and so you work with this is your baby that you've created. You're the founder. Um, how many other people work with you? Uh, at the moment, uh, we have about nine teachers working across Australia, so in different states. Mm -hmm. um, so um, they're responsible for developing the resources, and then we have the teachers in the other states who uh, review them to make sure they're applicable to um, to their states. Uh, now schools are following the Australian curriculum, mm -hmm. so it makes our job a lot easier because before we were um, um, linking all of our resources to individual state standards. So now we have a lot of help. Um, we're we're, as you mentioned, we are all volunteers, uh, so we work mainly in the late evenings and, mm -hmm. and the weekends to, to publish these and provide them for free online. Um, and our members, we have about just over 300 members at the moment um, who who all do like to have a say in, re in what resources we do put up and focus on and things like that. Um, yeah, so so yeah, we have about nine, nine teachers working at the moment. And when you say nine teachers, are they teachers that actually teach in school? school and they're um, yes. teaching that what you've sort of created the resources uh, well, actually, I'm not sure, I'm, I would hope to think that they would be using the resources in class. Um, they're, they're very passionate teachers. They're very passionate about the cause. So I, I would think so that they, the majority of them are teaching in secondary and primary schools. Mm -hmm. um, our education officer at the moment is based in New South Wales, mm -hmm. um, and our head content reviewer is based in Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yes. Uh, um, we, we do have a lot of people involved. We do want to make sure that we do produce resources that are very accurate and mm. high quality and that meet the um, current outcomes of the national curriculum. So, so we do need that expertise on board. Um, that's really good news that you're just having one sort of umbrella, like the one curriculum instead of all the different states and territories. Yeah. That would make that's it a bit easier. Really <laughs> it makes it a lot easier, and actually, with uh, the new curriculum um, that's been fi that was finalised um, last year, th there is a lot of opportunity for humane education now. Mm -hmm. So it is actually very easy to produce these resources and, and have them meet that criteria. For example, um, the curriculum has a big focus on ethical understanding and critical and creative thinking, mm -hmm. and there there aren't very m many resources um, that directly address those those key capabilities that are required throughout a student's entire schooling. Um, so that, that is a great opportunity for humane educators because that, those are the main outcomes that, that we want to achieve for students. 
And um, what sort of age? I think you mentioned before secondary um, schools. So what what age do these sort of things suit? And for our international guests, can you just explain maybe the ages for each grade as well? Yeah, absolutely. So our resources at the moment focus on K to 12, um, which is about five to six years to 16. Mm -hmm. The majority, though, so our quarterly magazine uh, is aimed to children um, aged between 8 and 14. Okay. Um, um, so that there's the overlap, upper primary and, and lower secondary there. Um, our Kindness Club, which is an extracurricular club that students can start in the school also is aimed at children 8 to 14. But um, we're hoping as we grow we'll be able to have more resources, especially that address um, year, in, year 11 and 12, um, mm -hmm. and particularly Definitely. students studying agriculture and philosophy even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so that's really great that you've covered the whole the whole from beginning to end of education yeah. that's really cool and um so yeah you encourage students to th think critically and compassionately about animal protection issues within australia yeah. how what's a what's a good tip to do this whether or not someone's a teacher or even just a parent of of children what would be a good tip that you would suggest um, well, it depends on, on the age, of course. So parents, of course, play the biggest role in raising um, social, socially responsible and compassionate individuals. Um, the, way te the, the role that teachers can play um, w with younger students, um, for example, our resources for lower primary um, focus on a range of topics, so companion animals. And, and for that age group, we focus a lot on responsible pet ownership, so things that that age level can easily relate to, so why it's important to be a responsible pet owner, um, caring for your pet, um, uh, being a aware of their emotional complexities and, and things like that, and emotional needs as well as being, need, you know, fed and water, mm. you know, given water and things like that. Um, for our older students and in our magazine particularly, we focus on individual issues that are happening, and um, we try to encourage children to um, think about it more critically. So, for example, um, in our most recent issue. Issue, we've covered the uh, greyhound racing industry. Mm. Um, so a way that we try to promote critical thinking and compassion is pretty much to provide the information because these sort of industries are, are veiled in secrecy mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the biggest problems and why we want to focus on animal protection because these industries that are currently exploiting animals um, lack transparency, like, lack transparency mm -hmm. in, to a very serious degree. Um, so it's about um, getting that information out there and asking the right questions like um, do humans have uh, the right to to treat an animal this way, um, or what are the inherent problems of um, breeding animals for profit or entertainment? Mm -hmm. So, so really getting children to think about these real um, moral issues involved in these sort of industries, and, and young know, children love talking about these mm -hmm. issues. That they're passionate. They love animals. Children have a natural love and fascination for animals. Um, so, so it is something that they do enjoy talking about um, and challenging, you know, their own ideas and, and things like that. Yeah, that's really good. There's quite a few things there yeah. <laughs> for people, yeah. And um, you were talking about your book or the magazine and um, I just wanted to mention that you were the or Think Kind um, was a recipient of two different grants and this was the beginning of the year, wasn't it? Uh, it was late last year. Or late yeah. last year, okay. Yeah. And so the first one was from Voiceless, which is an Australian group, and um, you got a grant for your project aimed at reducing the suffering of animals in industrialised farms and for the commercial industry. And then you also had another grant from the Pollination Project, which is a USA-based group, and um, you got a small seedling grant, and this was to develop the free quarterly magazine you've mentioned previously, and the Kindness Club kit, you also mentioned that, and that's spe specifically for the students aged 8 to 14. And the magazine's great. It's got lots of different things in it. It's got cruelty-free recipes um, and a lot of articles like um, um, are people uh, are some animals persons or things and friends or food. So, um, do you, how how do you get those um, magazines together? What's the process? Um, so we make we want to choose topics that um, are. are 
you are getting a lot of media coverage at the time. Um, so, for example, with, with the Greyhounds um, racing story that um, Four Corners mm. uh, covered, we had a lot of emails from young children who were very upset by what they had seen. Mm. So children are consuming media um, a lot more than I think a lot of people give them credit for. Um, so, so we do choose topical issues um, and our teachers all contribute to writing these articles and then of course they go into a process of being reviewed to make sure the language is age appropriate and the content as well is age appropriate, it's not too distressing mm. or upset, we, we don't share any graphic images or yeah. things like that. Um, and then um, the next process for the magazine is to create the teaching guide for teachers to be able to um, have their students read the magazine in class and then conduct activities mm. or lessons um, to reinforce I suppose the key um, messages that, that these articles are trying to highlight. Cool, that's great. Mm. And um, how and so that's quarterly. Can people download that on your website? Yes, yeah. But they yeah. go to our website. Um, we upload all of our magazines for free mm. on there. And the website is thinkkind.org and um, thinkkind's also on Facebook and Twitter. So um, you started Think Kind in 2013. Why did you um, decide to do it then? What was your process like? Um, have, have you been interested in um, veganism, animal rights, all that beforehand? Yeah, well, I, um, I became a vegetarian only about six years ago when I went to China. Sorry, I'll just... <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I had actually developed a strong interest in animal protection and um, and, and veganism. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I got into educational resource development and, and did see that gap, um, I realized how important it was to, to fill that. Um, and um, I did have contact with a lot of teachers have, with, with the job I was doing. Um, and, and so it, it was it was tough to get it all started. Mm. Uh, because it isn't it, it, humane education. Even though I think the Humane Research, Research Council um, they conducted a survey and found that 86% of Australians um, thought that it was important to implement humane education in yeah. secondary schools and primary schools. Um, so it, it, the, the reality it, does, it doesn't reflect that demand or that interest really. Um, so, so there was definitely a need for that in Australia, um, and especially resources that teachers were happy to use. Um, and, and that was something I had experience in. I, I knew what teachers wanted, um, which, which was something that they could, they could trust that would be that would meet um, the, the requirements of the curriculum, and at the same time um, promote these humane education values too. Mm -hmm. So your background um, in educational publishing communications, did you um, see that people were receptive to this? Were people saying like, oh, this is great that you did that? You said it was a bit hard in the beginning. Was it like, why are you doing this? Or was it like, oh, great, I'm glad someone has? Yeah, well, of course, with people already in the animal protection movement, it was super easy because yeah. it is something that people do believe in. With, with non-vegans, for example, um, there's a tendency to view it as pure pushing a, <laughs> an agenda for them, yeah. uh, which, is, which actually goes against the principles of humane education. So, um, look, our focus is definitely on animal, animal protection, but we do need to always provide a rationale for because people ask us, why, well, why focus on this issue and not human rights or um, yeah. environmental sustainability, which, which there are groups who are already doing that in mm. Australia. Um, so so it, it is tricky in that sense. Um, be, people do get defensive, especially when you talk about eating habits, um, as probably a lot of your readers and and, and visitors would, would understand. Um, so it's about overcoming that and really, um, I suppose, selling the reason, the core reason why we're doing that. And those are the, like, the values of promoting um, respect and compassion for all living things, but by recognizing that everything is interconnected, mm -hmm. humans, other animals, and, and the environment, yeah. and how our daily choices and actions have, have impact those things, mm -hmm. um, and that we do have the power to decide if they're going to be positive impacts or negative, mm -hmm. um, and, and really that's the primary focus of, of what we do. Yeah, and so you were talking before about you went vegetarian when you went to China. Can you tell us about your yeah. transition story? 
interesting story. Well, I, I was actually a, a meat eater. I had never really thought about animal, animal protection at all at that time. Um, and I, um, I confronted the uh, dog meat market there in northern China. Um, and, that, and I was totally shocked by it. So I, I have a, a dog at home and um, I, I, could, I, I was, found myself being really upset by it. And then when I went home, I really had to question why I had that reaction, uh, eating pigs, chickens and, and cows. Um, and I, after I thought about it for a little while, I realized that there was no way of justifying that. And, and it was completely hypocritical. And if I wasn't um, willing to, I suppose, eat, eat some animals, why why should I be eating others? Yeah. Um, so it was really just a, um, a rational decision I had come to. And, um, and that, of course, led to me becoming a, a very passionate activist yeah. um, just because I, uh, you know, talking to lots of people and trying to justify my eating habits afterwards because I don't know many vegans or vegetarians in my personal life. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't be very difficult to justify mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and so I think that that's the main challenge that I'm trying to overcome through education mm -hmm. um, and hopefully give that opportunity to a, a new generation to be able to question um, things like that and especially industries that are so powerful mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, re rarely get it. Now there, there has been a lot more media coverage on on these practices um, so in meat production in um, in breeding facilities for companion animals that there we are getting a lot more coverage but I, I think we do need to get um, to education to really make that long-term sustainable difference definitely and that that brings me to another question I was going to ask you if you which I find hard in a lot of ways. You edu you educate the kids, you inspire the kids, you get the kids to go, wow, I want to do this, I want to be vegan, I want to be vegetarian, I want to save all the animals. <laughs> How then do you or myself or all of us um, make that or um, encourage the parents to also go along with the kids? Because I find a lot of um, blocks from parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, look, we have we publish a lot of articles and resources for parents, mm -hmm. and a lot of our um, writers and teachers joke that it's really mainly educating the parents rather <laughs> than the children. This is really, I mean, we we offer veganism, of course, as as one of the biggest, if not the biggest, solution to a lot of these problems. Um, and children. Um, we have a lot of emails coming through parents saying, oh, our, our children have decided to go vegan. Um, and, and it's from what, from my end, what I'm seeing is that uh, us supportive parents, but of course there are the, the ones that wouldn't be so supportive. Um, so it, it, it is a big challenge. Um, a lot of our activities are actually are designed to um, um, help children um, or, or practice, I suppose, uh, constructive discussions. Mm. Uh, so we have debating activities, we have class discussions, um, and we try to teach children how to respect each other's ideas, how to challenge an idea respectfully. And hopefully, I mean, they wouldn't, they would apply that beyond the classroom and at home mm. if they have these difficult conversations with their parents. Yeah, definitely. No, that's really good. And yeah, just in general, to encourage people to be respectful and be able to have conversations and not, yeah. you know, be calling each other names or being judgmental is very important. <laughs> <laughs> and so, how are you, how do you feel with um, where things are in Australia at the moment? I, I know there's been a lot that's happened overseas um, with humane education. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's um, a lot of like all the animal liberation groups throughout Australia. They have, I think, mm -hmm. most states have a human yeah. a humane education officer in each state. Could be wrong, <laughs> um, but there seems to be a lot happening or starting to happen in Australia? Yeah, um, so uh, in the US uh, they're, they're making a lot of progress there. In fact, um, I recently they've just built their first solutionary school in New York, the Institute of Humane Education, sure. um, and they're planning to establish a lot more. Um, I think we are following a fair way behind here, um, but like I said, the way the um, Australian curriculum at the moment, the current state of it, does provide a lot of opportunities for humane education already. So I don't think it's a matter really of um, lobbying or campaigning 
seem to have it mandated in schools, even though there obviously is a high demand um, from parents um, for this kind of education. Um, I think the curriculum at the moment has an emphasis on uh, um, ethical understanding, um, critical and creative thinking, and we're developing resources to directly address that. Um, at the moment, I think it's sort of skimmed over, um, but it is a general capability that it, it, that needs to be taught um, across across all all of primary and secondary education. Um, so so there are plenty of opportunities at the moment. Um, it, it's just a matter of uh, more people and more groups coming in, and of course, schools and teachers um, choosing to implement sort of programs and and um, resources for that in their schools. So, if people wanted to get something happening in their school, or if they're teachers themselves, you know, start with your website, thinkkind.org, um, and is that anything else from that, or? Uh, yes, so um, Think Kind, we have a whole bunch of resources for teachers to download for free, our magazine as well. We also have um, our Kindness Club kit, which they can access on our website, um, and we're also going to be launching it in October this week for our Be Kind to Animals week, mm -hmm. which is the first um, week of October. Um, and uh, we do have a, a page of web links for schools who are interested in having a speaker come into their schools, and, and we've tried to find one for every state. Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so so hopefully they'll find the resources they need, and like you said, animal liberation. I'm not I'm not sure about every state. I know mm. in New South Wales, they they have a great education, a humane education officer there, mm. um, and if for teachers in Victoria, Edgis Mission provide a great program, mm. um, and, and probably another great one is Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots program, mm. um, which schools can um, look up or teachers can look up online, and um, and I know they do workshops and programs with students in schools. Yeah, so there's a lot of options for people out there who want to know yeah. what to do. Complete <laughs> more soon. <Thanks> yeah, <laughs> that's good. And so um, we were talking before, you were um, you just mentioned about um, when you went to China and um, how then you came back home and um, decided you didn't want to be a hypocrite anymore. Was it did you just become vegetarian first and then vegan? I did. Or what's, I did. Um, yeah. So... Within a, about about a week and a half, I mm -hmm. think I made the decision to become vegetarian, and and then slowly I sort of um, got into um, animal ethics literature, reading Peter Singer, and mm -hmm. and um, and then finding doing a lot more resource, uh, sorry, research on um, on other industries such as dairy and egg production, and and realizing that in order to be consistent, and I think that's the main um, the most important thing to me is to be morally consistent and mm -hmm. to act and live according to what I know are my own personal values. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think a couple of years later then I made the decision to, to be vegan. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> did you go, uh, did you do any um, volunteering or anything with any groups or anything like that? Uh, so while I was studying I volunteered with Voiceless, Animal Liberation and an animal rescue group. So mm -hmm. I had a glimpse of lots of different um, activities groups who do very different work mm. um, and that really gave me a well-rounded view of, of, of the animal protection effort or movement that was happening in Australia which is really exciting because mm. it, it, it's it's growing without a doubt um, and, and it is becoming more more mainstream at least that that knowledge of, of these industries and, and I suppose the the philosophy um, of living compassionately and, and humanely um, so um, hopefully by filling in this gap with education we'll, we'll be able to contribute a lot more to that movement too mm -hmm. and do you need um, if someone wants to get involved with think kind what what do you need from people yeah, so we're always looking for volunteers. We have um, not only teachers, we have volunteer writers, graphic designers who help us make the resources really colourful and, um, you know, interesting for young kids. Um, so there are a lot of skills that we, we can use and that we do use. Um, so if they, if they contact us via our website, um, we're always looking for volunteers. Cool. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Valerie, for taking the time to um, have a chat with us today. And I hope everyone out there has learned a lot of, a, well, a bit about um, humane education within Australia in particular. So make sure you check out thinkkind.org and they're also on Facebook and Twitter. See vivalavegan.net for more interviews with inspiring vegans. Thank you, Valerie.
Thank you. See you.